Good morning, and welcome to Your Life Matters, a COVID-19 vaccine education and awareness webinar presented by Cone Health. I'm Ronnie Owens, a marketing manager here. And like many of you, I am also a pastor, a pastor of the Well Church here in Greensboro, North Carolina. And we are excited that you have taken time out of your schedule this morning to learn more about the vaccine and our community initiatives. If you have joined us by Zoom this morning, you are muted to keep the presentation moving and to keep us timely. However, you are invited to connect with us and to ask your questions in the chat at any time during this presentation. And at this time, I'd like to introduce you to our moderator uh, to lead us further into this conversation. Our moderator this morning is Chuck Wallington, Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing and Communications Officer with Cone Health. Let's welcome Chuck. Thank you, Ronnie, and good morning, everybody. I am delighted to invite you and welcome you to today's webinar. The whole purpose of this conversation that we're about to engage you in is to equip you with information about COVID-19, and in particular, the vaccine that's now available in our marketplace. We want to make sure that you are fully equipped with information so that when it's your time, you can make an informed decision about taking the vaccine, and we also want you when you're having conversations with others in the community to be able to enlighten them and inform them about the vaccine so that when it's their time, they will take the vaccine as well. I am joined in today's webinar by Dr. Alvin Powell, whom I will introduce a little bit later. He will carry the bulk of this conversation. And at the end, my colleague Keith Elliott, who is Home Health's Vice President and Equity and Inclusion Officer, will moderate the Q&A session. So next slide. Here's a little more detail about what we're going to talk with you about today. So first at Cone Health, we've established some very specific vaccine goals, and we'll talk about that on the next slide. So we'll share that information with you. Dr. Powell is also going to talk about the history of mistrust and distrust among African Americans with the U.S. healthcare system. It, it, it just is what it is, and he's going to talk us through that and acknowledge that history. At the same time, there's some facts about the vaccine and its effectiveness and its safety levels that, that Dr. Powell will share with you as well. There are also a number of myths about the vaccine and he will dispel those myths. And then we'll talk at the end about how you can help us to carry forward this conversation. So on the next slide, let's talk about our specific vaccine goals. So uh, there's a two-prong approach that we're taking to sharing this information. The first is why you're here today. This is about building trust, educating, and informing our black and brown community leaders about why it's necessary for them to take the vaccine. We realize as an organization that we're not in this work alone. And so we've been committed to building partnerships with the Guilford County DHHS, as well as DHHS organizations in surrounding counties to administer the vaccines at large venues. At the end of the day, all we care about is that those who qualify when it's their time, they take the vaccine. We are though tapping into one of our sweet spots and we're partnering with churches and other organizations and taking mobile clinics into the communities where black and brown people live. Um, we find it's better to go where our, our folks are as opposed to having them to always have to come to us. We're also focused on increasing access to vaccines through automated and direct outreach. And we'll talk about that as well. And then finally, as an organization, we've committed that at least 35% of the doses of vaccines that we get on a weekly basis will go specifically to black and brown community members. Again, a concerted effort to make sure that we get shots in arms for folks in the black and brown communities. So with that, I am delighted to introduce my colleague, Dr. Alvin Powell. Dr. Powell is the Chief Medical Officer for Annie Penn Hospital, as well as Cone Health's Chief Health Equity Officer. Dr. Powell has been in this role for the last couple of years, and he's also been Medical Director for Cone Health Hemodialysis Unit at the Rockingham Kidney Center. Dr. Powell came to Greensboro in 1990 as a nephrologist with the Carolina Kidney Associates. By way of his educational background, Dr. Powell earned an undergraduate degree from Columbia University, a medical degree from Tufts University School of Medicine. He completed a nephrology fellowship at Emory University, 
and he's board certified in internal medicine and nephrology. He's also a member of the 2018 class of the Disparities Leadership Program, which is associated with the Disparity Solutions Center at Mass General Hospital. Dr. Powell also is past president of the medical and dental staff here at Cone Hill. He's past chair of the medical staff peer review committee and is a current member of the credentials committee and the physician council for equity. And if that's not enough, he's also done medical missions work in Haiti and Honduras. And in his spare time, he is a big brother. So he's very actively involved, not only on the healthcare side, but in the community, all with a goal towards making this community a better place for us to live and work. So with that, will you please welcome my colleague and our friend, Dr. Alvin Powell. Dr. Powell. Thank you so much, Mr. Wallington. I really appreciate that kind introduction. Thank you so very much. And good morning to each and every one of you. And it's really my pleasure this morning to speak with you for a few moments uh, about vaccine challenges uh, related to the most important public health emergency of our lifetime. That's the coronavirus or COVID-19. As Mr. Wallington stated, I'll begin by discussing the African-American historic distrust of healthcare systems, and then move on to vaccine safety and effectiveness, and then discuss myths associated with the COVID-19 vaccine. So as we think about healthcare in America, we have to think about fundamental issues related to structural and institutional racism in America that really first began in 1619 when the first enslaved African was brought to the east coast of this continent. That event, that single event began an enduring foundation of inequalities that continue today. Uh, government redlining involving housing in the 1930s resulted in poor economic developments of communities, exposure to toxic and hazardous environments and poor housing conditions. In addition, the history of Jim Crow segregation and discrimination that many of us have experienced included limited to no access to health care, human experimentation, and deception. So with the intimate knowledge of this history, some people in our communities now face reluctance or hesitancy regarding taking the COVID-19 vaccine. A December 2020 Kaiser Family Foundation poll revealed that a significant number of African-Americans have concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine safety uh, and the fact that it's new. So when we consider the history, we understand the concerns. Uh, James Baldwin once said, history is not the past, it's the present. We carry it with us, we are history. So what are some of the concerns that are relevant and give support to fear from a historical perspective? What are the past injustices that have created present concerns? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The most famous example is the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. The Tuskegee syphilis experiment began in 1932 at a time when there was no known treatment for syphilis. Just so we're clear, the men were not injected with syphilis. Syphilis was common at that particular time. Uh, after being recruited by the promise of free medical care, 600 African-American men, they were sharecroppers with limited education. Uh, they were in Tuskegee, Alabama. They were enrolled in this project. Uh, the experiment's purpose was to study the natural history of syphilis when it was untreated. Unfortunately, the men were lied to. They were given the promise of getting medical care and treatment. And despite the availability of penicillin, which was invented or discovered in around the 19, early 1940s, these men were actually denied treatment. And they remained untreat, untreated for 40 years until 1972 when the Associated Press exposed this travesty of healthcare. 40 years, 1932 to 1972, uh, and during that period of time, some men died from syphilis. Some men had other complications related to this infection. Some of the wives were infected and some children were born with congenital syphilis uh, 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 concerns. And so this was a significant medical issue, a distrust, a deception that occurred that people remember today 
and it's mentioned often with the concerns about this COVID-19 vaccine. Next slide, please. In the 19th, uh, 19th century, uh, the father of gynecology, uh, he was, is, has been revered until recently. J. Marion Sims performed experimental surgeries without anesthesia on enslaved black women over and over again with no anesthesia. The techniques and discoveries that he perfected on those women continue to be used today. Uh, because of the exposure of, uh, in, in the knowledge of what he did to these women, uh, as I mentioned, he was a revered physician. In 2018, his statue that was at the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology was removed. Next slide, please. In 1951, a Johns Hopkins doctor, without permission, took cancer cells from this woman, Henrietta Lacks, an African-American female. She was 31 years of age at the time. She had cancer of the cervix. And remarkably, these cells, unlike other cells, in the laboratory grew. They reproduced, and they've continued to reproduce since 1931. And these cells have been refer referred to as immortal cells. They've never died. And they, these cells have been used in scientific research and responsible for over 100,000, over 100,000 published uh, uh, research papers, billions of dollars for the biomedical industry and major advances in science, including viral research, cancer research, and genetic research. And these cells are referred to as HeLa cells, H-E-L-A, Henrietta Lacks cells, uh, uh, the, and Lacks family became aware of this research for the first time in 1975. Next slide, please. In the 1990s, a study was done in Baltimore, uh, Maryland. Uh, it was done to reduce lead in the paint in homes of, of families where children were living. Uh, this was a two-year period. The children and families were exploited by the researchers, and without full knowledge or full consent, these children, many of them, were exposed to toxic levels of paint during these procedures to remove the lead from these homes, and consequently, some of these children developed lead toxicity, brain damage, as a result of this experiment. Next slide, please. And women of color were sterilized against their will and against their consent, the eugenics project. The thought was that the, there would be an improvement in the quality of people by sterilizing certain people. And that's only a fraction of the history. It continues to go on and on and on. But let's move on to the COVID-19 vaccines. Let's talk about our communities. Next slide, please. We know that COVID-19 disproportionately affects people of color and African-Americans in particular. African-Americans are more likely to get the disease, get hospitalized, and to die. So if we focus on this slide in particular, we note on the right side of the slide, we see that 1.29 million individuals so far have received the first doses of the COVID-19 vaccine as of yesterday. 36.9% uh, of the people in North Carolina are classified as people of color. Over 40% of the people in the Piedmont Triad are people of color, and 37.4% of the COVID-19 cases uh, uh, in our state are of people of color. If you look to the left of this uh, slide, you see that the percentage of vaccinations in our community, in the triad, uh, or in our service area, based upon race. And what we see in this pie graph is that right now, 15% of Black individuals in our community have been vaccinated plus an additional 7% of people of color. So a, a total of 22% or 23% of the individuals so far have been vaccinated and recognize that's compared with 37.4% of people uh, in our uh, state who have been positive for COVID-19. So we need to do a much better job of getting people vaccinated. We need to register them. We need to take the, uh, our relatives and loved ones uh, to, to vaccine sites, get them on a waiting list, uh, uh, help them out uh, with the internet to get them signed up so we can get them vaccinated. Next slide. So let's talk about why the vaccine's safe and why you should take it. And, and if you'll just give me a personal moment here, let me share with you that I have already uh, received both shots of the COVID-19 vaccine. 
Three of my children are healthcare workers uh, uh, and they have already received the vaccine as well. My wife is a healthcare worker and she has received the vaccine as well. So I'm a believer in the vaccine. I believe it's safe. I know it's effective. Uh, and uh, I recommend that people get the vaccine. Next slide. So let's look at the facts. Uh, the numbers are really shocking. They're in fact tragic. Uh, when you look at the number of people who've died worldwide, two and a half million people, greater than two and a half million people worldwide have died already. This is a global pandemic. 113 million cases have occurred worldwide. And in the United States, we know already 520,000 people, more than that, have already died and they continue to die. Right now, the, the death toll is dropping somewhat. It's down to 2,078 uh, people dying per day. Again, as of yesterday, this is still too many people who are dying. And we look from the perspective of people of color, African-American people right now remain 2.8 times more likely to die and 3.7 times more likely to be hospitalized. This number is important because as we vaccinate people, as we immunize them, if we are not immunizing people of color, this death rate compared to white individuals will actually go up, it will climb. So it's really essential and important for us to get people vaccinated. Next slide, please. So uh, let me just say before I go on to this slide that I know, and you all know, perhaps many African-American people who are uh, uh, friends from my childhood and others who've died for COVID-19 or have been sick or have been hospitalized. And many of you probably have as well. And I know many of you pastors have probably already performed funerals for families whose loved ones have passed away. So you know how devastating COVID-19 can be to families. But one thing I can say is that I know of no one, no one who's been hospitalized or died from the vaccine. So how effective is this vaccine? It's very effective. It's in fact 95% effective. That's a real success when we talk about uh, vaccine science. Next slide, please. So how, how safe is, is this vaccine? So despite the, the myths about how quickly the vaccine was developed and doubts about its safety, uh, when you're vaccinated, you stay safe and you help stop the spread of COVID-19. And of the more than 68,000 people who received Moderna or Pfizer in the vaccine research trial, only one person, only one person contracted a severe case of COVID-19. There were no safety uh, concerns that were identified in these clinical trials. That's really significant uh, with, uh, when we talk about almost 70,000 people. And so far at Cone Health, 13,132 physicians and healthcare workers have been vaccinated so far. And let me just say this, that when you think about vaccines and you think about the science, recall and recognize that the people who are receiving this are the people who probably know the most about this, healthcare workers, physicians and nurses, and other people in, in the healthcare industry who were able to read in a relatively intelligent way a lot about the science and the research related to this, uh, this, this vaccine and, and respect the safety uh, in the research that was put into this vaccine. But people over the age of 65, 121,000 so far have been vaccinated in the first six the days of public clinic. And again, no significant safety concerns have been identified. Next slide. So when we talk about side effects, people hear about side effects of the vaccine. They wonder about whether or not one can get sick from the vaccine. People don't really get sick from the vaccine. They have side effects. And we think about our children, our infants, if we have children, when they go to the doctor and they get their vaccination, the children often cry that evening because they don't feel well. They often might have a fever or maybe some chills, and that's the result of the vaccine. The COVID-19 vaccine does something very similar. People will complain of a sore shoulder a few hours after they get the vaccine. Some don't. 
People have fatigue, some don't, headaches, muscle aches, chills, and fever. These are all similar symptoms that people get from other vaccines. It varies from person to person. Some people have no symptoms whatsoever. Other people have more symptoms. Uh, uh, and so it varies from person to person. But in general, after one to two days, all of these symptoms resolve. And once again, the benefit of getting the vaccine far outweighs uh, any side effects that we're talking about and that we see here. Next slide, please. So I know that many of you've heard several concerns expressed in the form of myths from fam various family members or friends or even members of your congregation. And I've heard them all as well. And I really try not to repeat them because I'm not sure how helpful that is, but we'd like to correct uh, those myths that may be preventing individuals in our communities from rolling up their sleeve when it's their time. Next slide. Myth number one, the va COVID-19 vaccines cannot be safe because they were developed too quickly. Um, well, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, every phase of the vaccine development was completed more efficiently through innovation by public and private healthcare organizations. This was something that was important to get done because we're in the middle of a global pandemic. In fact, scientists had a head start. They used decades of research that was, have been developed and utilized on similar vaccines. And of course, many of you have heard of Dr. Kesmikia Corbett, an African-American scientist who was part of the NIH team that worked on the Moderna vaccine. And vaccine development over the years has gotten faster. Uh, and again, during this pandemic, all hands were on deck. Companies were funded to accelerate the process. No steps were skipped. All safety measures were completed. And many steps, which typically would be done uh, uh, sequentially, were done simultaneously uh, to speed up the process. Next slide, please. The mRNA method of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines were ultra my DNA. Uh, there are no elements of this vaccine that were, will alter your DNA in any way. And scientists designed this vaccine for this one purpose, to prevent us from getting the virus. Uh, you can't get COVID-19 from this virus, it con this vaccine. It contains no infectious elements. You can't give, this vaccine will not give you COVID-19, and it will not affect your human DNA. Next slide, please. I already recovered from COVID-19, so I don't need to get vaccinated. You do need to get vaccinated. It's the safest thing that you should do. We don't really know how much effectiveness or how much immunity you get from getting COVID-19. So it's best to go ahead and get the vaccine. Uh, it's a much more effective way to be assured that you will uh, be immunized against uh, potential exposure in the future. Uh, you can wait uh, until after you've fully recovered. Uh, this slide says 45 days. It can be given actually sooner than this. Uh, but if you've received monoclonal antibodies, the recommendation is clearly that you wait about 90 days after uh, the positive test. Next slide, please. No African-American or Latino participants were involved in the COVID-19 vaccine trials. That is not true. About 20% of the people involved in the trials were people of color compared to the usual rate of about 3% uh, in clinical trials. So there were, this was a diverse population of people who were in these clinical trials. Next slide, please. The vaccine trials did not include volunteers with pre-existing conditions common in the black and Latino community. And that was not true either. Both vaccines have volunteers with pre-existing conditions such as heart disease and hypertension. And the vaccine uh, typically does not uh, create any problem with common medications uh, that people take uh, when they have these pre-existing conditions. Next slide, please. I'm allergic to eggs, so I shouldn't get the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, that's not true. Uh, people who are allergic to eggs who cannot get the flu vaccine can, in fact, get the COVID-19 vaccine from Pfizer or Moderna, which do not contain any egg products. Next slide, please. 
And number seven, I love this one. It's really interesting. It's really sci-fi. COVID-19 vaccines were developed to control or track the population through microchips. The thought is that people were going to in inject you with nanotechnology, with chips, and they could track where you were going. And this is not true. This was all about the ability of technology to be able to put in computers who has been vaccinated. It's not about putting chips in people. It's about putting data uh, in, in computers. Next slide, please. So when can I get the vaccine? Next slide. This graphic shows that we are currently uh, have, have proceeded on from phase one to phase two. Healthcare workers and long-term staff and residents, that was phase one, phase two, people over the age of 65 and older. And now we are proceeding on with uh, phase three, which includes teachers and uh, frontline essential workers. Uh, and the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Guilford County Health Department is addressing the issue with respect to, to teachers. Uh, next slide, please. So what's the current vaccine deployment uh, plan for uh, Cone Health? We wanna build trust, educate, inform, and encourage black and brown community members to take the COVID-19 vaccine. That's what we're doing right now with you all. We want you all to do the same thing, really, to build trust, educate, and inform, and encourage folks to take the vaccine. Uh, Cone Health has committed to 35% of the vaccine doses to go into the arms of black and brown community members. So we have vaccine available now that we didn't have a few weeks ago, uh, and we really want to be aggressive about trying to meet the needs of the communities. Again, as I expressed earlier, because of the, the disparity that exists, if we don't get enough vaccine into brown and black arms, we will see the, the results of this uh, in, in months from now with worsening uh, disparity with respect to who's dying and getting sick from COVID-19. Uh, and so it's important that we get uh, these doses in arms. We, we are partnering with Guilford County to administer uh, vaccine at these larger venues. You know about uh, Mount Zion Baptist Church and also uh, at uh, the um, Coliseum. We're using our mobile clinics to establish COVID uh, vaccine sites within the minority communities to provide easier access. We're going into churches, community center, housing communities, and those types of places. Uh, and we're trying to increase access to uh, vaccine appointments through automated and direct outreach. What does that mean? That means we're using computer technology to reach out with, with phone calls to, to families. So we identify people of color, uh, based upon the data that we have, and we're automatically sending out messages to communities to try to uh, increase the number of people of color to get vaccinated in our communities. Uh, and so this is a strategy that uh, has already proven to, uh, to, to reduce the disparity, but we have a lot more work to do, and we need your help uh, to try to make this successful. So at this time, I'll ask Ms. Kiva Elliott, to let you know about uh, how you can help us to get more people vaccinated. Ms. Elliott. Thank you, Dr. Powell. And I wanna take this time to thank all of you that are attending today and really, really wanted to say thank you. Thank you for taking the time to learn and learn how you can educate your congregation and your community. So at Cone Health, we want you all to know that we are right here with you and we need the community to work together for us to um, fight this pandemic. So um, we're gonna spend some time talking about questions and how you can help us. So we're gonna start, you can go to the next slide, Ronnie. So we're gonna talk about how you can help us. And what some of the things that we feel like you as influential leaders in your community really can help spread the word and get people registered for the vaccine. So when it's your turn, we're asking that you register for the vaccine. Um, as Dr. Powell said, he has taken the vaccine and so have I. Um, and I'm very, very grateful that I had the opportunity to, 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 to do that and um, I encourage you to receive the vaccine. So we want you to help us get the word out. So when you're having presentations or you're having classes or whatever you're holding within your church, 
um, talk about the vaccine and let people understand what you just understood about the myths and how, um, how th that they are myths and that we as um, in the black and brown community, we have to protect and help to protect each other. So please just spread the word as you can. Um, also, you know, when we think about registering for the vaccine, it can be difficult for some people if they don't have access to a computer or internet connections, um, or they're just not computer savvy. So we're asking you to identify members of your congregation that can help register others for the vaccine. Next slide. So, um, when we talk about helping to register, what we're, what we're suggesting is that you find someone in your congregation that will serve as a proxy and they to identify and collect information for the community members. So we'll have to have their name, their address, their date of birth, and then you can connect with the Cone Health representative that will give you a spreadsheet that will help you fill out that information. And once you do that, then we will schedule your first appointment and then the second appointment will be given to them at their first dose. So what we will do is send, send out a toolkit to you. So you'll have all of this information, information in there, the spreadsheet, where to call and how to, to let us know that you want to do this within your congregation. The next slide. So um, as we talk about this, um, we're gonna continue to reach out to black and brown communities with this presentation. And we want to be able to offer this to whoever wants to receive this in the community. So what we are planning to do is have a um, site on our website, conehealth.com vaccine town halls. And what you will see there will be dates that we have already, read, already scheduled webinars, education materials so that you can use in your own presentation, and an option to be added um, soon where you can say, hey, I want to partner with Cone Health, Health to host a webinar. So, um, but until we have that up, if you would like this presentation or know where we could go and, and do this webinar, for um, other people in the community, you can just reach out to Jill Mc McAllister and she will help you to do that. But we will give you all that information so you'll have it right there at your fingertips. So what to expect at the vaccine clinic? So as I said before, I have taken both doses of the vaccine. So I can tell you how it was for me when I went to a clinic. So you have to wear your mask and you have to be socially distanced. So that's what we've been doing for the last year. And so that's not going to change. Um, and if you had, you have to wait 15 minutes after you take the vaccine, just to make sure that there aren't any um, reactions or allergic reactions to the vaccine. Now, for me, I have very um, sensitive, I have very um I have allergies of all sorts. And so I had to wait 30 minutes after I took the vaccine to make sure there weren't any um, reactions to it. And luckily I had no reactions. Um, so you also, when you take the first vaccine, you know this requires you to take two vaccines. And so um, before you leave there, you make an appointment for your next vaccine. Common side effects. So I had no side effects the first the first dose. So um, when I first got the dose, I said, I don't think she actually gave me anything because I did not feel a thing. And then about a couple of hours later, I started to feel pain in the um, injection site. And then the next day, um, it was nothing. So I, I had nothing um, after the first dose. The second dose, um, I did get tired. I was a little tired and I had a headache. And 24 hours later, that was gone. So, um, so really with the side effects, they're very mild and, and, and it depends on the different person, but um, had no issues with it. And um, a lot of my family members have taken the vaccine. And of course, my colleagues at Cone Health and I've pretty much heard the same story. Next slide. 
So if you want to get more information about update, up-to-date information regarding the vaccine efforts, you can go to conehealth.com conehealth slash vaccine. And so what I really want to say here too is that as we said before, we're partnering with our community health agencies and trying to make sure that we are aligned and that we are um, working together to make sure that everybody has access to the vaccine. You will also see in the next coming week, perhaps, that um, the vaccine will be offered at CVS, Walgreens, and um, so they will have a separate process for um, scheduling or registering for the vaccine. But, but what we wanna say here is this vaccine is going to be accessible to everyone. And yes, we're focused right now on the black and brown communities because we know the impact that COVID-19 has had on, on those communities. And we wanna make sure that access is there. So as you start to see um, think, you know, more organizations offering vaccines, please take advantage of that. And Cone Health is just one of those. So you have many options in the community to get the vaccine. Next slide. So um, we have carved out this time to answer some of the questions that you all have submitted to us because we wanted this to really be um, a learning zone. We wanted to educate, make you aware of um, the myths and, and just kind of give you, get you informed so that you can make an informed decision about taking the vaccine. So now I'm gonna invite um, my colleagues back in so that we can get some of the answers to the questions that have come up in the chat. So, all right, so let's see. Oh, we got some really good questions here. Thank you all for submitting these questions. So Cone Health um, is allotting 35%. Oh, that's not the question, sorry. Um, do you need insurance to take the vaccine? I recently reti retired and my insurance will not be effective until March. If I am 62 and is high risk, may I take the vaccine now? So let's answer the first question. I'm sorry, these are kind of joining together. Do I need insurance to take the vaccine? To me? Yes, Dr. Powell, sorry. It's okay, no problem. No, you don't. You pay for it already. The federal government is, is taking care of this. So no, that should not be a barrier for anyone to get the vaccine when it's your time. Okay, so it, when it's your time, take the vaccine. You don't have to pay anything. It, it's free. Awesome, thank you. And that's a really, really important message, right? That it is free. And um, we need to make sure we're getting that message out um, right. to our communities. And, and, and let, me, let me just add this other part because he did say he was 62. Uh, so well, wait, that was the next question. I was oh, reading okay. two questions at once. Right. Okay. <laughs> so I'll ask that, that one again so you can answer that question. Um, so if I am 62 and I am high risk, may I take the vaccine now? If yes, where do I register? And so we've talked about that, but. So high risk would include a healthcare worker uh, or a resident in a long-term facility. Uh, right now, I believe that would also include someone who is uh, uh, a, an educator uh, and perhaps as well a, a frontline worker. So I think those are the categories right now. Uh, okay. So if he fits into that category, yes. But if he does not, then no. Okay. All right, so the next question, will the COVID-19 vaccine always be administered by Cone Health or will the vaccine ever be administered through private physicians? And will there be a cost at that time? Dr. Powell, do you know? Okay. Yeah, yes, okay. uh, yeah, it will be administered by private physicians just like the flu vaccine in the future. Okay. Right now, and so that might be even before the pandemic is over. Again, it's about supply, the supply chain. In the physician's office, there is the potential, if you have insurance, that your insurance will be charged for the administration fee, okay. but you should not be charged anything. Your insurance can be charged, billed for that. But again, the vaccine's free. Okay. So if you have insurance, you go to your doctor's office, they, the insurance might be billed to administer it. Right. The vaccine itself is free, 
and you still should not be charged anything for the vaccine. Okay. These are great, great questions. Um, so the next question, for those who have severe allergies like food or medicine or have had anaphylaxis previously, should they have any concerns about getting this vaccine? Well, I think you already answered the question when you shared your story about people with allergies, general allergies, food allergies, those types of things. Generally, it's not much of a problem. If someone has had anaphylaxis, uh, you should bring your EpiPen with you to the site when you get your vaccine and definitely stay 30 minutes. That's right. And I, so, I did have my EpiPen with me, so you're right. So right. just in case. Absolutely. So it doesn't mean you can't get the vaccine, but because you've had that history, you have to be real careful mm -hmm. uh, because who knows? Anyone can have a reaction. That's right. All right. The next question, in order to expedite vaccinations within the black and brown communities, will, will lower, lowering the age be a possibility? Well, that's not gonna happen. The, 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 the state is gonna decide uh, who's going to get the vaccine. I think the real issue in the brown and black community right now is uh, uh, access okay. and hesitancy. Uh, and I think if we address those two issues like we're trying to do right now, that's going to be the, the, what's going to make the difference, access and hesitancy. And, and taking care of younger people is not going to solve this problem as far as the pandemic. Uh, we need to take care of the most vulnerable, uh, and those are the older people in general and, and, uh, and sicker people, so people with comorbidities. Yeah. These, these young people, uh, they're, they're reservoirs for the, for the virus, so they're spreading it. And yes, they need to be taken care of, but they're not dying at the rate of the older people. So we need to take care of these uh, folks who are older first and then work our way down. Right, okay. Um, are there other questions in the chat? Um, I think. Okay, so here's another one and it kind of goes to, within our church, we have a congregation that is younger than 65. How can our church still help to get black and brown people in the community around us registered? Oh, wow. It's a lot that you can do. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'll say a little bit about that and then you all jump in too. So um, if, if you have a congregation that's younger, then maybe they could help volunteer to be a proxy and register older people in the community. So you can actually have your congregation get out into the community and start to work with other churches, partner with other churches that have an older congregation or at a um, senior facility or anything in your community where you can, you can help get them registered. And then also help with transportation, right? If they need that. So um, those are just a couple of ways that, that you can help. And I think that the thing about it is we got a partner and we gotta come together and all of us working toward the same goal of fighting this pandemic. So um, whatever you can do to help get people registered or get people educated even, and give them the information that they need to make an informed decision um, will be very, very helpful. Do you all have anything else to add to that? I think you said it beautifully, Kiva. I don't have anything else to add to that. Okay. All right, so I think that was the last question in the chat, but I, I do want to um, invite Chuck, um, our panelist, to talk about his experience with getting the vaccine, because I think it's important that we hear from all voices, right? And that we hear from different, different voices and how they um, experienced the vaccine and how they made the decision right? What, what was the decision-making um, process that you went through in order to decide to take the vaccine? Thank you, Kiva. I appreciate the question. So I'll be honest with everybody. So when there was discussion about a vaccine being available, um, even though I work in healthcare, my default position was, okay, I don't have to be one of the first ones to take the vaccine. I'm going to wait and see how other people react to it. And that was my position for a while. 
And then I came to myself. You know, I realized after listening to smart people like Dr. Powell and others that I get the privilege of working with, if they think the vaccine is safe and if they're willing to take it, then by golly, I need to take it as well. The other thing that really came home to me was the reality that my 90-year-old mother lives with us, my 96-year-old mother-in-law lives with us, and of course, my wife is there. And so if I choose to not take the vaccine, I'm making a very selfish decision that could impact their lives. And so when those two pieces of information came together, an appreciation for the science, and then an understanding that I could play a role in ending their lives if I didn't take the vaccine, it became really clear that I need to put myself aside and take the vaccine. And I am so glad that I did. I'll also say that when it came time for my mother and mother-in-law to take the vaccine, they were more than willing to do so. And they've lived through the history that Dr. Powell talked about, but they were still willing to take the vaccine. And both have now received their second doses. And we are looking forward to the time, hopefully sooner rather than later, that we can gather with family on a small basis that we've not seen in a year you know, just to hug each other and love on each other and, and kind of celebrate being back together. So that was my journey, Kiva, in terms of the vaccine. First, I was reluctant. I was taking a wait and see approach. And then I realized that was not a smart approach for me to take. So I'm very glad that I've taken the vaccine. And I don't like needles, right? So that was the other piece of the conversation. I do not like needles, never had. I had to work through that as well. And I can tell those of you who haven't had the vaccine, it is virtually painless. And if I say that, you can take that to the bank. Awesome. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you. Um, we've had a, one more question um, come in. No, we've had two more, which is great. So we have a few members that do not have the mobility to leave their homes to take the vaccine. Are there any current options for them to receive the vaccine? Dr. Powell, do you know? I don't know. Okay. Okay. I can answer that question. That's okay. a great question. It That's is. That's a great question because there are home, people are homebound. Right. And I think that gets back to your original question about doctor's offices. I think when the vaccine becomes more available, those kinds of options will be available. Okay. But okay. I'm not sure if, I, I don't know if Mr. Wallington has an answer to that. I don't have an answer, but I have a commitment. Let us figure out what an answer could be, because mm -hmm. I had not thought about that before. We do need to figure out how do we solve for that? If somebody is totally homebound, um, how do we get a vaccine to them? So um, let's let's commit yep. to figuring out what an answer and a solution could be. Okay. Thank you for the question. Yeah, very, very good question. Um, we have another question. Will people who signed up through the Cone Health spreadsheet that was sent to the church be called from Cone for their appointment, it says Monday. So maybe we need to, um, so we need to take this one offline too. So if we can, if I can figure out who did ask this question, we'll reach out to them individually and talk about um, the Monday appointment. And the question may be, Kiva, what's the length of time from the time I submit the spreadsheet to when folks are going to get called to be registered for a vaccine? That may be the question as well. Okay. So let's all right. So we I have the name that. in the in the chat. So we'll we'll make sure to communicate with, with right. that person to um, understand the question. Um, so this is another question. Each time I've been to register, all the appointments are full. Is there a, a way to register black and brown congregation members or do we need to wait until the clinics come to our neighborhood? Kiba, you wanna talk about that? Cause that's really the whole proxy process that you, you talked about, right? Yeah, so, so I was gonna say, and then we can talk about the, um, the clinic, the mobile clinic, I mean, if we need to. But um, one of the things that we're trying to do is, as we said, we're allocating 35% of our um, vaccines for the black and brown community. And if, if the appointment is full, then they're being put on a wait list. And then we're working that wait list so that we can get people schedule, scheduled. So um, right now, that is the way to register. You go on to the site and you sign up um, through the conehealth.com slash vaccines. 
And that's where you will register for the vaccine. And so if it's full, you'll be put on a wait list and then they will start to call you to do that. Okay. Um, so I, I don't have any more questions. Does anybody? Yeah, I'll share some, <clears throat> excuse yeah. me. I'll share a question with, with you all. Okay. Uh, you share your experience and I can certainly talk about mine. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure if I've read this, but, but I want to use this term COVID-19 anxiety. Okay. All right. I think we've all experienced this, but I want to share with you and you can share with the, the folks listening as well. When I got my vaccine, my COVID anxiety dropped way down. I had a sense of peace about me that I hadn't had in a while. Uh, and I'm just wondering if you all felt that way. And if you, if you did share it with the, the folks who are listening, it's a, it's a real benefit of the vaccine, I think. It is. So I, I definitely felt that. Now I have to tell you, I was questioning because I didn't feel anything in my arm. <laughs> so I was thinking, oh gosh, I probably didn't even get anything. So, um, but no, once I knew that, and then I knew that my second one was scheduled and um, what that would look, what that would be like and the, and the, um, the 95% efficacy of you know of the vaccine it just really um it really helped me and one thing that I will share personally is that my grandmother is 92 and she is um transitioning and so I got to go down there to see her this week because I had not seen her um doing the COVID vaccine we were facetiming and all of that but I felt confident because I had the vaccine that I could go there and at least see her and touch her. I had on my mask, but still I felt that sense of calm. And so I'm, I'm grateful that I had that because I was able to, to be with my grandmother. So, so it is a sense of calm and, and, and peace. I agree with you. Yes, I, I agree as well. It's definitely a sense of calm, a sense of peace. Um, and I couldn't help but to think about one of my aunts who died of COVID. She was in a nursing home here in Guilford County. She died of COVID in June of last year. Um, another aunt died of COVID. Again, she was in a, had been in a nursing home for 30 days and passed away um, of COVID. And then a friend of mine in his early 60s, prime of his life, uh, passed away from COVID back in September and devastated those of us who know him. And so I couldn't help but to think about, you know, gee, it sure would have been nice if they had lived to at least um, be able to take the vaccine. And we all know that God had another plan for the three of them. Um, so I do take comfort in that. Uh, but yes, there was definitely a sense of on some level, we can all begin to move forward with life as we become vaccinated and do the things that we have not been able to do for the past year. That's great. And Kiva, I want to compliment you on, on wearing your mask after you've been vaccinated. And we should just remind everyone that once you've been vaccinated, you need to continue to wear the mask. It's really important uh, until again, we get the green light. And that's going to be months from now. Right. Uh, keep wearing the mask. We don't want to transmit it to someone else uh, as an asymptomatic carrier. Uh, the, the vaccine probably protects you, will protect each and every one of us, but there is a small possibility that we won't get sick from COVID, uh, but we'll, we'll, it, we'll get it and then we can transmit it to somebody uh, in, unknowingly. So That's it's right. important. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. I, um, I don't see any other questions in the, the chat and thank you all for that, that have had the questions, posted the questions, and um, posted your contact information in the chat too. So we'll be reaching out to you to get you more information. So this really concludes our webinar for today. And you're gonna get a um, webinar, a survey that will pop up. And we ask that you please take that survey because it will help us as we continue to educate our community and, and give them the information they need. So we really, really appreciate um, your feedback. Um, so I, I want to thank you again. And Dr. Powell and Chuck, it's always a pleasure to be um, panelists with you all. So thank you for um, your time and 
we appreciate you. And please help us, help us to get this, get the word out, to get people registered, because getting this vaccine is extremely important and we know it's a choice. And so we wanna just provide the information that's needed so that people can make that informed choice. So thank you for your time. And um, that concludes our webinar. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Yes, thank you.